Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. It's Wednesday. This is a very exciting program. This is kind of a culmination program of sorts, although I don't want it to be that. I want it to be one of many programs along the way. Community Matters, Offshore Investment in Hawaii with a very knowledgeable guy, uh, Mike Sikarski of PEG. PEC, Pacific PEC. Enterprise Capital International. Quite okay. a long term. Right. Doing business with China for decades already. Right. Uh, spending a lot of time in China and watching, watching the investment flows both ways but especially from China into the U.S. And um, welcome to the show again, Mike. Well, Jay, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah, great to have you here. I mean, this is, this is a very nutritious discussion of a very important subject. It takes off from what we did last Thursday, and Mike was there uh, at the, uh, at the uh, downtown forum in Maniakea on April 16th, <clears throat> where we talked about offshore investment in Hawaii. What can we do to make it happen? What can we do to manage it? This is critical to Hawaii's future, to its con economy, to its kids, to everybody, and, and we don't pay enough attention. So when Mike comes in with the kind of numbers and reports that he has for us today, it's really, really important. Nobody's covering this story but Think Tech and Mike Sikorsky. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike, you went and looked just as a matter of you know, getting the data, getting real data from Rhodium Group. Tell, tell us about Rhodium Group and what did you get from Rhodium Group? Uh, Rhodium Group's been around now for about uh, 10 years or so, uh, founded by uh, a former, uh, I think, Department of Commerce official who uh, worked in, in uh, cross-border transactions and so on for the Commerce Department. And the Rhodium Group began cataloging Chinese investment in the U.S. starting in the year 2000. And they have uh, acquired a state-by-state -state, uh, breakout of Chinese investment, uh, the amount, uh, the number of transactions, the amount, the total amount of those transactions, uh, whether those transactions were uh, for startup companies or uh, merger and acquisition, and whether the investor was the Chinese government itself directly or uh, by a private company, uh, which often is the Chinese government in different form. And, and so, uh, it's a very valuable uh, resource of information to keep up on what's going on with Chinese investment in the U.S. And, and surprisingly, uh, Chinese investment is rather modest in the U.S. I'm talking about the total investment. Uh, in contrast to other countries like Ireland or Norway, uh, which are in the top 10 of foreign investors in America, China ranks 14 right now. Mm, interesting. Well, can you give us the flavor of it? You've got a number of charts uh, with the tops and the bottoms and the highs and the lows. Uh, give us, you know, give us a sort of sampling of this data uh, to make us understand where this investment capital is coming from. Well, California, uh, again, this is from 2000 to 2014. California uh, has the uh, most number of Chinese investments, uh, upwards of around, I believe, 260, 68. Uh, the investments total about six billion dollars and uh, over 10 years uh, those investments initially went into uh, real estate but then very quickly went into high tech uh, into a uh, chip uh, uh, fabrication into uh, software uh, programs and so forth are they buying companies or stock in somebody well, else's company uh, both uh, the the majority of those investments um, uh, were in the uh, uh, startup phase or startup companies and uh, I think about a third of them were uh, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers uh, uh, acquisitions then you've got Hawaii uh, which is down at the, the bottom <coughs> uh, near the bottom with five investments uh, I believe the total number of, uh, of that investment uh, figure is uh, uh, maybe a uh, couple hundred million and uh, it's all in real estate so that's so interesting you know and surprisingly uh, <coughs> rhodium identifies that three out of the five were made by uh, direct government units uh, Chinese government units so uh, you know I mean the, the the value the importance the significance of that number is it puts to rest all the speculation you hear on Bishop Street doesn't it <laughs> about how they're coming they're not coming what are they doing you know and, right. and how they're taking over this that and the other thing 
<coughs> numbered corporations, uh, you know, pieces of property hither and yon. It's, it's just that it's fairly modest. Um, so we shouldn't abuse ourselves over this. It's fairly modest. It is very modest uh, because the priority, not only for Chinese investors, but from Ireland and Norway and so forth, uh, tend to be, of course, to the mainland because you have higher value targets there. Uh, we, uh, are, most of our targets, if not all of our targets, are real estate. And uh, you can buy real estate just about anywhere. Uh, but. And you can buy real estate in states that manage real estate better than we do. We're not top of the line in, in terms of uh, permitting, in terms of right, right. Uh, you know, predictable investment, uh, um, investment friendliness. Exactly. And so you've got high value targets. Uh, what investors are looking for is they're looking for sort of lower valuations. Because when you're an investor and you look at an investment target, you say, well, what is the valuation of that target? Uh, let's say, the, uh, just for sake of discussion, the valuation, let's say, is $100 million. Investors always think that they can do better. Uh, and so uh, that $100 million may register to them as a undervalued asset. Oh, it's only $100 million. If I acquire it, then I can develop it into maybe a $500 million or a $1 billion invest. So they're looking for valuation growth. And the valuation growth is not here in Hawaii. The, value, the valuation growth, is for the, for the time being anyway, the valuation growth is on the mainland where you can find high tech or you can find uh, uh, infrastructure projects, opportunities. Uh, you can find entertainment. There's a lot of foreign investment that goes into entertainment. Uh, not only the movie industry, but communities like Nashville, uh, where there's a big entertainment industry. Uh, 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 industry. Uh, Missouri, what's the uh, Branson, uh, Missouri, mm -hmm. where they, uh, I think the Branson people just made it an entertainment capital. Anyway, so a lot of investment goes into those things that have reasonable valuations to begin with or are undervalued, where the investor can see a high appreciation. That's a natural. Right. That's right. You want, investor that, that wants happens that anywhere. Uh, yeah, and that goes on anywhere. The Chinese are sophisticated enough to make those choices. Right. And, yeah. and maybe that wasn't the case when the Japanese came in the 80s. Uh, they would buy anything that was trophy. And I think when the Chinese first came around, they were buying anything that was trophy. Now they're sophisticated global investors. Exactly. Uh, looking for value proposition rather yeah. than image or as you say, uh, trophy. Trophy is still important to some extent, but <coughs> it, it's now not the total end game. Yeah. Okay, well, so they're, they're here, but they're here modestly. Um, and I mean, that is uh, actually, um, that is profoundly important to us because we have to see the reality of this because the reality of this is the reality of Hawaii. But let's look at Hawaii, uh, or rather, let's, let's look at China uh, as opposed to other investors in the country. Because I, I think a lot of people are walking around thinking that China is a, you know, the biggest investor in, in, in America. But that's not really so, is it? No, it's not. And I think one reason that uh, uh, seems to be a uh, mainline uh, impression is that it's often misstated that China is the largest holder of our treasury bills. China is the largest foreign hold, well, I'll take that back in a moment. China has been the largest foreign holder of our treasury bills. So when you look at how, what, what percentage of our total treasury bills are held by foreign interests, it's roughly about a quarter. Interesting, because and people are walking around thinking it's much more than that. That's right. It's so, another revelation. Right. So China was the majority holder of that 25%. Yeah. But it was announced last week that Japan has displaced China now as the number one holder of that 25% uh, of foreign very, T-bills. Very interesting. So, um, and that's an interesting story in and of itself. But, um, so it's that sort of thing that gets confused by either the people who are reporting on it or, you know, 
it may be reported accurately by the first reporter, but then the second reporter only hears half of the story, and by the time the news gets to us, uh, China is the, has almost all of our treasury bills. So starting from that, then you go out and you say, okay, what else is happening uh, to give that impression? And there have been trophy uh, uh, purchases, especially in New York, uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, Park Avenue, uh, some of the iconic uh, uh, properties. Um, a Chinese uh, company purchased uh, the Waldorf Astoria really? recently. <laughs> and uh, um, so this, these are high visible, high, with, uh, uh, properties with high visibility, yeah. so naturally they spark the story. But beyond that, no, there's, there's uh, very little activity. But what's there interesting are... is that the, the, this fiction that people have that China owns so much and is such a relative of our bonds and is such a relatively large investor in the U.S., it, it paints the way people think about China. Right. I think it probably paints the way we address our foreign policy to China because we, we see them as such a threat. But if you look at the real numbers, it's not like that. Right, and, and, and then you've got the leaders in Jungnan Hai who are being criticized for things that they're not doing, yeah, you know, really. being criticized by Americans for things they're not doing, and then, so it's kind of like, hey, read your own, uh, <laughs> you know, papers, or look at your own reports. Yeah, look at Rhodium and, Group. <laughs> yeah, look at, and, and, and see what, what's really going on here. Um, but I think also, uh, Jay, what gives a uh, impression of a large investment presence is that there's so many delegations that come to a U.S. ostensibly for investment investigation and that sort of thing. And really, yes, uh, there's a, somewhat of a serious intent to look for investment, but for a lot of those officials, it's also a holiday. They get entertained because, you know, they're perceived to have the money bags. So it's really a nice experience to be on a, a Chinese delegation coming to look at investment. Uh, also, you have a lot of private individuals, Chinese individuals, uh, who are looking for investments. And that, that group, that type of investment is growing, but that's the $500,000, that's the million and a half, where you buy an old, uh, decrepit strip mall of maybe 10 stores in, I don't want to don't malign any particular ball, city, <laughs> but uh, let's say in some backwater city in America. And um, so there's, there's a bit of that going on. Uh, but in terms of uh, total uh, amount of investment, it's still a, a very small investment. Uh, so it, there's... It could uh, be that what you have here is a lot of investigation. I mean, you can't fault this. A lot of investigation, a lot of people coming around looking getting more and more sophisticated on how you analyze possible inv you know, investments. But you only pick the top 1%. You only want the brilliant ones. <clears throat> and therefore, that's why the ultimate number of you know, dollars invested is not that great. Right. Because whether they're right or wrong about this, they're trying hard to only pick the top 1%, the brilliant deals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I think that um, there's still a long way to go in contrast to what Japan is investing in, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, the U.K. and others. Uh, they're, they're far ahead. And, and people can say, well, you know, the, the, uh, the Chinese are upping their rate of investment. Not in America. Uh, and the, the reason for that, yes, there's some, uh, first of all, the amount is so low that if you have somewhat of an increase, What's uh, uptick. What's the total investment in America? Uh, I'll give you, I don't want to uh, uh, misstate okay. the number, so I'm going to take a look here. And for 2013, uh, it was uh, about two and a half uh, billion dollars. Okay. When we come back from this break, Mike, we're going to talk about the rest, where it's coming from and why it's coming from and how that compares with the, the Chinese investment here. That's Mike Sikarski, uh, that's uh, Pacific Enterprise Capital. No? And, uh, international. International, <laughs> okay, of course, that, that's assumed. That's assumed. Right. <laughs> we, 
It's a long story behind that, so I'm not going to take your time to tell you that story. Okay, and this is Community Matters because we are really talking about Hawaii. We're talking about offshore investment in Hawaii. We're continuing the discussion of last Thursday at the Downtown Forum. We'll be right back. This is Alex Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leesom, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. We're talking about Twitter, too. And we have a Twitter address, and uh, we do get Twitter questions. We have one we're going to deal with in a few minutes when it comes to the right time in the show. But if you want to send us a Twitter question or comment, uh, we have a way to read it right here from this table. And uh, the, the address is at Think Tech Hawaii. That is Think Tech High. Think Tech High. So, like the other guys, uh, send us a, a Twitter question or comment and we will address it. So, Mike, um, we talked about 2.3 or 4 in total uh, in the past year in, from China. Well, in 2013. 2013, which is the last year for numbers. Okay, right. well, so what do we get coming from other places and what other places are coming? Well, Japan, uh, these are all for 2013. Uh, Japan was the leading investor with 44 billion, a little over 44 so billion. Way higher than two point something. United Kingdom was second with 41 billion. Luxembourg, now uh, Luxembourg, uh, 26 billion. Now understand that a lot of investors around the world will register their investment funds in Luxembourg. So, the, so it's a pass-through. Exactly. So yeah. the investment from Luxembourg isn't necessarily from the citizens from or anywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, companies of Luxembourg. Um, Canada, to some extent, Canada is a pass-through, but uh, uh, Canada is fourth at $23 billion. Uh, Fifth is Switzerland, which is another, can be another pass-through, uh, which could be Chinese. By yeah, the way, Chinese sure. companies the in China, uh, yeah. Switzerland or Luxembourg or yeah. Canada. Um, Switzerland at 16 billion. Ireland at 15 billion. There tends to be a pass through in Ireland as well. Netherlands at 12 billion. Germany, not so much of a pass through from Germany. Uh, 11 billion. Norway, uh, the ninth largest investor in 2013. Nine, a little over 9 billion. Uh, the UK islands in the Caribbean, which are all passed through, yeah. uh, eight billion, and, and a lot of Chinese companies are uh, have uh, registrations in the uh, Caribbean. South Korea, our, our neighbor to the north, and uh, we have a free trade agreement with South and Korea. They have money invested in local real estate here. We know that from uh, last Thursday. That's right. They're number eleven at six billion. Uh, France at three billion. Mm -hmm. Mexico invests more. Of course, they're our neighbor to the south with the NAFTA treaty and so forth. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Mexico invested $3 billion, and then China comes in at 14 with... Uh, number 14. Yeah. Number 14 with about 2.5. And, and right behind China at 15 is Denmark uh, at uh, $2.3 billion. And Denmark's total economy is way tiny smaller yeah. than China's. So what does this tell us? This is really revelationary also. The China is way down the list. All these other uh, countries, especially in Europe, maybe some of them are passed through. We'll get to that. Um, but they're, they're larger than China. And China has you know, n really not distinguished itself as being a, a big direct investor in the US. Uh, the, the mood uh, for Chinese investors uh, to come to the U.S., whether they be government investors or private investors or front companies for the government uh, investors, 
um, have uh, th that tide has kind of washed up and now sort of is is washing back because we have uh, some of the strictest, if not most uh, strict, uh, uh, transparency requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, there has been for the last, oh, maybe three years now, and I've been waiting for this shoe to fall for a long time, and I'm glad it's finally falling. Uh, an investigation of Chinese companies on both the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ uh, who basically rewrote their stories to qualify to meet the criteria for listing on those exchanges. When they registered to be when they, That's right. What do you mean rewrote? You mean not told the truth? That's Well, uh, they, they retold the story. I'll okay, leave it at well, that. Would, with, with put the your own imagination <laughs> on that. <laughs> and, and so now those uh, those uh, several of those companies are under investigation. I'm not sure about indictments, uh, but uh, what it has revealed is that, yes, the stories were rewritten and that um, corporate governance and other kinds of issues that are so crucial to qualifying to list on those boards uh, are not as uh, they were represented and so forth. Uh, so what that has done is to dissuade um, uh, many Chinese investors from coming here. And so where do they go? Do they go to other jurisdictions or other op, uh, areas where there isn't exactly the uh, same kind of due diligence, or not due diligence, but uh, expectation for uh, transparency, uh, you know, obeying the regulations and so forth. And there, there's, I have to say this from both personal experience and from my colleagues, because I just went through this uh, the last four months. And that is that many Chinese investors are as naive about America as Americans were naive about China when America first began investing in China in the 1980s. And There's so- something comforting about that. There is, <laughs> yes. And uh, even more so in many ways. But one of the characteristics is that, and this isn't really different from what Americans or other foreigners expected when they went to China, is that there are many Chinese investors, both official and unofficial, who believe you can game the system, <clears throat> game the system in America as they game it in China. Ah, sure. And they hire American advisors, they hire uh, American attorneys, they hire people here on, in, in Hawaii to advise them on all these things. They pay for the advice to go through the pro forma of getting that, because they've been told you need to get local advice. At the end of the day, they want to know why they can't get certain things in the way, whether it be permits, approvals, uh, entitlements, well, you name it, as they do in China. And at the end of the day, they want to do it their way. And so they ignore or they exclude, finally, their American advisors. And they spend a lot of their time figuring out how to game the system rather than doing what should be done and getting on with the business. Sure. So in the meantime, what it is they're investing in or have invested in and, and, and so forth begins to languish. Because this is a very, uh, uh, America is a very competitive place. And so um, I have experienced that myself. I've talked to uh, other Americans uh, who've had the same experience. So there are a combination of uh, factors as to why the uh, investment, uh, the amount of investment here is is uh, not going do they, up. Do they succeed? When they go it alone and try to game the system, you know, after having rejected the advice of their right. advisors, do they succeed? Not really, because they make other mistakes. In, when, when you try to game, it's like anything. If you try to game, uh, same thing for Americans in China. If you try to game the state administration for industry and commerce, they've got so many hooks and so many little crevices that you might game 90% of whatever it is. It only takes one but to bring you exactly, down. Exactly, <laughs> but you're going to get caught somewhere else. 
And uh, so, you know, the best policy in China is, okay, uh, you're there, and the reason you're there is because presumably you accept what the situation is, so therefore you go ahead and, and, and do your business according to the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, and so uh, here in the U.S., the same thing. We've got so many little ways, uh, the, the system does, that uh, ultimately they get, uh, whoever tries to game it, whether it's Chinese or anybody else, uh, ultimately they will uh, end up. Now they also believe that they can pay off people. Like corruption. Exactly. In order to get through some of these uh, um, uh, checks and balances that we have. That's part of the gaming mentality. Yeah. That's right. And so uh, uh, that's of course unacceptable again from any investor from anywhere in the U.S. or excuse me anywhere in the world uh, we expect that if investors are going to come here, uh, that they're not going to engage in that kind of uh, behavior. Right. But uh, for the most part, it's that we have very strict rules and regulations for disclosures and their stories, and it's just the way it is back in China, their stories don't match up with those requirements. Mm. You know, you mentioned before, and we looked at all these... Uh, other countries which were pass-throughs into the U.S. where, you know, it could come from anywhere, Luxembourg, for example, and some of that money probably is coming from China. We don't know for sure because it's a blind to us. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that that, that that wish to be anonymous, the wish to be behind the blind so that no one knows exactly where the money comes from is part of the same gaming mentality, don't you think, is to be anonymous. And, and I think there are many reasons, if you're a, uh, a Chinese investor, to want to be anonymous. And part of that is your own system back in China. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because uh, there's been a, a, you know, a free-for-all for some time on uh, capital leaving China, unauthorized capital. I remember attending a uh, two-day session in Beijing, 1995. It was sponsored by The Economist magazine. And it was uh, well organized and uh, great speakers. One of the speakers was the uh, head of the World Bank office in Beijing. And I think he stunned a lot of people when he said, this is 1995, uh, that today China is a net exporter of capital. It's exporting more capital than it's taking in. Now. I was surprised to hear that, but I wasn't surprised to hear that because I also understood what he was saying, uh, and that is because of some experience I had had, I knew that uh, uh, elements of the PLA in particular, at that time, PLA was very strong, they still are. Active in business. But uh, they were active in business um, uh, at a different level, uh, but still very active. And so there was, uh, the PLA was running their own uh, exporting uh, operation. <clears throat> and uh, so a lot of that money, in, uh, or uh, much of the, the money going out uh, came from that source. And then there were several other sources, whether they be uh, that dreaded word in, in Beijing today, factions. Uh, but there were a lot of factions that had their own. So there was a lot of, and, and I understood it. Uh, and so. Since at least 1995, China's been a, a net exporter of capital, but not always as transparent as uh, the Zhongnanhai, the people in Beijing, would like to see. So uh, that's uh, another reason for sort of operating anonymously sometime is, is, is not just uh, for the sake of operating out in the world, but uh, for... Uh, protecting what's going on back uh, in China. You know, it doesn't sound like that's going to, that as a, as a, as a phenomenon gonna, is going to change in major ways anytime soon. Uh, that it's just the way it is and it'll be a long time before they, you know, get current on exactly how to do business overseas. Well, and you know, that that's one reason why um, uh, Homeland Security, for example, has upped the ante on uh, foreign capital coming into the U.S. And when I say up the ante, up their surveillance of uh, foreign capital coming Cash into money. the U.S. I mean, greenbacks, a dollar. That's right. Dollars and, and dollars, and, and also other large investments. Yeah. 
uh, because there's a question, uh, where are they coming from? Uh, is it connected to terrorism? Is it connected to organized crime? Is it connected? So in, in all of these issues that we have today that we didn't have maybe 20 years ago, or they were much lower level issues back then, uh, now that they're higher issues, everybody kind of gets caught in that net. Including Chinese investors. That's right. We're going to take a minute to for a break. It's Mike Sikorsky, um, PEC International. Yes. Okay, we're here on Community Matters because this is a Hawaii community matter. It's offshore uh, investment in Hawaii. Um, uh, don't hold your breath on waves of Chinese capital coming in here right now. But we'll be right back, and when we come back, we're going to talk about what Hawaii can do to make, it, make itself a more uh, attractive place for Chinese capital. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in, in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live with, with Mike Sikarski, PEC International. For an extraordinary show, I have to say, Mike, this is really, this is teaching me stuff I didn't know, had no idea, and hopefully some of the people out there will have the same reaction. So at Community Matters, it's uh, offshore investment in Hawaii. It's largely an examination of Chinese investment as opposed, as compared to other in investments from other places in the world. And I mentioned before that we had some, uh, we had some questions on Twitter, and I want to throw one at you here. Um, Let's see, it's uh, uh, Faircloth is a fellow's name. Does Hawaii have a, a system to turn spent pulp from sugarcane into biofuel energy? And if so, or to the extent that it does, uh, how does that affect our appeal, our attractiveness as, as a uh, haven for Chinese capital? I, I'm not sure that we have a system, but if we do, uh, or if we did, uh, it would have high appeal to a lot of uh, potential investors from around the world. Uh, when you look at that band uh, uh, around the world where sugarcane has grown, uh, you've got uh, tremendous potential. There are many countries and markets uh, for this kind of conversion to biofuel to support the, uh, the local or, or the national uh, energy need. Uh, so it's, uh, it would be, uh, I think, very highly attractive. And that opens the whole issue about energy. You know, we do have some stuff going on in energy. We cover that here on Think Tech on a regular basis. And I can tell you it's, it's not a perfect world. <laughs> There's all these issues and troubles going on. But we do have a lot of prospect in energy. And energy could be a very attractive thing for the Chinese to invest in. I, I can remember, uh, you know, cases where they invested on the mainland uh, into uh, renewable energy. Big bucks, big, huge bucks because that's what they need at home. They want the technology. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, tell us what you think we need to do to groom ourselves, to make ourselves more attractive with unctions and oils. So they come, they come from far away, and, and they lay uh, large amounts of capital on. What do we do? Well, I'm going to just briefly, uh, maybe 15 seconds, um, say that we've already gone through all the issues about um, the investment environment here, uh, that Hawaii has got a lot of uh, infrastructural uh, weaknesses uh, that don't attract investors. So I think those kind of arguments uh, uh, or issues have already been well discussed. And uh, so I'm going to go on to some other issues. I think the one, one of the most important things that we have neglected, and when I say we, 
I'm not talking necessarily about the state of Hawaii in terms of a government, but I'm talking about people as well here uh, who would have an interest in seeing investment uh, come into Hawaii. Very li from what I have seen, very little if any attention has been given to looking or understanding the mindset of the investors. Uh, the whole discussion has been about us. Uh, what do we do? What do we don't do? What do we have? What do we don't have? And uh, all these kinds of things. It's been a very highly us-centric discussion about investment. And very few have suggested, well, let's go to the Asia. Let's go to these countries in Asia. Let's go to these countries in Europe. Let's go or, or to these funds, whether they be sovereign funds, whether they be private funds, family funds. And let's go and sit down with them and ask, what is your investment philosophy? What is your investment uh, uh, value? What, what are you looking for? What types of things do you invest in? When you invest, what do you expect to get from that investment? What do you expect in terms of the operation and so forth? And to my knowledge, now maybe someone's doing it and I don't know about it, but to my knowledge, we have no one here who understands the mindset of the investor. So I think that's the very first thing we need to do is to uh, have that understanding and then see which investors line up or align with what we have and what we want. That's the first thing you, that, that's basic uh, to investing. Uh, the, the next thing is that uh, I made a, actually I made a list. Uh, the next thing I think that needs to be done here is whether it's private or public. We need to ask, what is it we want people to invest in and actually make a shopping list? And I haven't heard anybody yet come up with a shopping list. Now, what would be on the shopping list? Are we looking for investors to invest in greenfield projects, startup projects? Are we looking for investors to invest in brownfield, things that are already do, do we have needs here that already exist that investors could come in and their investment would help to overcome those needs plus a return a, a, on investment? Mm -hmm. um, are we looking at infrastructure? Do we want uh, some investment? In, these are not either ors, but uh, can be ands. What, do we have any investment, uh, infrastructure investments that we would like to see what, so if so, what infrastructure? What, what water? Yeah, what or transportation? And and particularly sewage. for for what purpose? Yes, sewage on Maui or water on uh, on the windward side or you know whatever, uh, and really get down to begin. I mean, get to uh, moving down to identifying sort of a general at a general level okay. what our needs are. Um, also in services, are there certain services that we would like to see in Hawaii that we don't have or existing services that we would like to see improved? Can investment improve those services? Can they bring new services? And again, begin to put together a general category list. So the first thing is, who are those investors out there and what are they thinking of? What's their mindset? What do we think? investment would best help us accomplish with, with our list, now you can begin, as I say, to begin to make some alignments. Now you can begin to target, say, well, you know, investors coming out of X con country, they tend to invest in this sort of thing. So then you put your resources at that point of attack to talk to those people. Uh, or there are certain funds uh, that fit right in the sweet spot of what we're looking for here. So now you try and bring the state or uh, uh, the attention of the state to those investors so you, you've got some targets. It's huge. You know, up till now, we've been, we had two or three offices uh, from DVET in China, and they're all focused on trying to help American small business do business in China. None of them, as far as I know, are focused on this kind of uh, examination. What can we do to set up a strategic pattern of investment? We really have to do that. And the other thing that comes to mind, Mike, is how come we never did it before? You know, the, 
the, the, the, the train has left the station and right. we're still figuring out what we want. Right, right. We're still looking for a train. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Actually, we have a train, <laughs> which, which, which uh, is uh, not to you know, beat dead horses, but I have to tell you, that's a huge project. And investors look at, okay, what else is going on in a investment environment that may impact my investment? And when you see that certain things are running at a deficit or there's no plan for, uh, nobody knows how much it's going to cost to operate or to maintain, these are big, big red flags to investors. Or you have activism kind of controversies like the 30 meter telescope. This tends to scare away investors of all kinds. Exactly. And then financials. We, you know, we, uh, we need to be more aware of what investors are looking for on, on the issue of financials. I, don't, I haven't heard anybody yet converse, and I'm sure there are people here because we have investors here, but I haven't heard anything in the public discussion or uh, in any effort to uh, try and create a, a public uh, uh, debate or discussion on what kind of financials are investors looking for. That's part of the mindset. And uh, so we need to understand that. If we can meet that, if we can meet that, then we can get them to invest. It's that simple. Well, I, uh, we, we may, yeah, we, we may not meet it, but at least, at least we have to understand what it is they're looking for, yeah. how it works. Some investors are looking for short-term returns. Some are looking for medium return. Uh, some are uh, long-term. Now, there are investments that are called tactical investments and strategic investments. A tactical investment would be uh, an investment in, uh, let's say, a Hawaii, uh, uh, let's say, a golf course or a Hawaii company. Let's say a Hawaii company that turns uh, uh, sugarcane pulp into biofuel. The same question that That's was right. on Twitter. So a tactical investment would be, okay, let's invest in that and let's uh, uh, develop because Hawaii is developing alternative uh, energy forms and they're committed to, so let's, let's go there, do that, and so forth. But, and, the, and there are certain investors who look to do that. But then there are other investors who look for strategic investments. A strategic investment would be where the Hawaii investment in converting sugarcane pulp to biofuel would be one pearl in a string of pearls that they're going to invest in maybe around the world or in that particular industry or whatever. And so this one pearl is part of an overall strategic plan that they have. This is knowing the mindset of the investor. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, some of the uh, investments may be more tactical, some may be strategic. So when we go out and talk about Hawaii as a investment destination, who are we talking to? We don't really know who we're talking to. We're not saying, look, we've got tactical opportunities, we've got strategic opportunities, and to be able to describe what a tactical, what a strategic opportunity is for Hawaii. Mike, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, we have one minute left. Okay. Uh, try to give them a message now. If you want to give them a message, give the community, the government, business a message, what do we need to do to, to groom ourselves for participation in this in this world investment uh, process have a plan all the information I'm talking about all the things I'm talking about it's out there you just have to go and get it but to get it you've got to put together a, a, a plan uh, and have a focus uh, and then that'll guide you to what information it is that you you need to get but all the things we're talking about are they're, they're not mysterious at all uh, when you have a plan. I'm not satisfied. We gotta, we gotta do this again. We have to continue <laughs> this discussion, Mike. Okay. We're, we're, we're only part way through. I know there's a lot more in your mm -hmm. list and on your mind and, and in my mind. So we'll, we'll, we'll reschedule, we'll come back, we'll continue the conversation. This is something we have to wrestle with <laughs> and act on. And okay. So thank you. Mike All right. Sikorsky. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs>